So, uh, hey, Sean, um, we met each other, I think, the first time around JPA, DALI, and Eclipse, pro Eclipse Link project, right? That sounds right, yeah. Uh, what was your relation to, uh, to Eclipse Link? So you were one of the committers, actually, right? Yeah, so actually I was involved uh, before we were, well, I was involved in the open source pro process. So when I joined Oracle, I had been a long time top link um, consultant, you know, oh. external consultant mm -hmm. to the object people. And when I joined Oracle, one of the one of the earliest things we did, I don't, I don't remember how quick we did it when I joined, but we started this whole process of open sourcing. And so that, that's how I was involved in Eclipse Link is because I was involved in top link before that. This is interesting. And and why it started, actually? So uh, I was really surprised by the move that it became open source suddenly. I think it's the same reason you're seeing other people, even now, things we're doing open source, is because some things are just not competitive advantages in the sense of, you know, we expect certain um, infrastructure to just be there, right? So we expected JPA or we expected object persistence to just be part of the Java EE stack. And even though we felt that like there's other various open source and closed source products at the time, uh, we thought it was advantageous to let people have the code, uh, make it open source, make it maybe more generally available so that when, from a commercial commercial perspective, they were looking and shopping for an application server, they would find that they were already comfortable with the various components that were part of the app server we were selling. So WebLogic in this case. So, you know, if they have an open source, they've used an open source library, uh, regardless of what it is, and then it's also a piece of that app server they're thinking about, that, that makes them comfortable, right? Makes you comfortable. Yes, and this actually worked well. So I know projects where they wanted to stick with the application server. This part was uh, Glassfish because it had Eclipse Link because the error messages were nicer. So the developers really liked Eclipse Link. Right. Yeah, so that's uh, that's we like I say we thought we were we had a, a quality product, a quality uh, framework, and so I'm glad that worked. And I did see this with large companies who were who were moving between yeah, Glassfish, WebLogic. It was good to have the same the same JPA. And you said you uh, you were consultant for Toplink, even at the small talk days or with Java. Yes, even in the small talk days. So I uh, started with Toplink for small talk, and so it was very easy. Uh, to be a consultant, actually, at that time for Java, the Java side, because um, at that time, the small talk was all kind of clear source. You could see all the source. You could see how Toplink worked. So we went to Java. It wasn't as transparent, but I understood the internal concepts and you know the basic pr principles because of the small talk. Uh, that's interesting. And who did it? Was it WebGain back then? Uh, no, it started with the object people, which is the T-O-P for Toplink. Ah. So it's the object people. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I, 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 <laughs> oh, okay. Not, not everyone knows that, but um, it's a funny thing when you when you mention it because it makes so much sense. So the object people uh, was a startup in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, they created Toplink. And um, and then they that company was bought. It was divided into two and bought. So the, the education part of that company went to um, BEA. Mm -hmm. And then the software piece went to um, WebGain, right? Which was being put together as this ultimate Java EE tool set company, right? Mm -hmm. and so the tools went one side and then the uh, training went the other. And then, you know, I think there was a, I don't think that that market ever really took off. Everyone thought that everyone will just be beating down the door to, to buy Java EE tools and, and they weren't. <laughs> and, so, and so when WebGain, I guess, ran out of money, Uh, Oracle bought the top link uh, component off of WebGain mm -hmm. and the people too. And what was your favorite feature or what is your favorite feature in Eclipse Link or top link? Uh, uh, in the small talk days, uh, I, have to, I have to mention it because the thing that comes to mind first, the best thing w was that um, you could take small talk blocks of code and they would be translated into SQL for you. So you could say, just like in Java today, you have these stream, you know, you have basically um, stream functions like iterate over collection and reject the items that don't match a filter or select the items that match a filter. Mm -hmm. That exact same small talk would be basically translated into SQL, into a select statement. Oh. So it's very natural mm -hmm. to write, you know, um, code that just work with lists and, and uh, that it turns out they were actually database tables. Okay. So it was an... Nice, smooth integration. It was some clever trickiness in the Smalltalk implementation, but it was very cool. And you still like Smalltalk? I haven't done it for a while. You know, I was thinking about it. Um, I do. You know, it, it had a big effect on my my uh, worldview. 
-hmm. you know, small talk, everything was an object, like mm -hmm. everything. Um, even, you know, implementation wise, maybe the implementation would, would optimize and cl cleverly do things, but everything was an object. Even, even in the implementation, integers were objects. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way you could tell the difference between an integer and an object pointer was the first bit was a flag. They, t they, t they stole a bit, mm -hmm. you know, so if I had one bit set, then this is a primitive int. And if otherwise it's an object pointer. And so it was a very smooth, very small language conceptually with a large complicated library. <laughs> In one of my migration projects, we had to migrate a huge uh, Toplink project in Smalltalk to Java. And uh, what we did, we use Eclipse Link, and I had the chance to work with uh, really talented Smalltalk developers, and they were really, really object-oriented. And they really yeah. challenged me, because what they even did, you know, they had even inheritance of inner classes with some concept. It was a really nice and clean project. And at the end, they still prefer Smalltalk. But, um, yeah... <laughs> But uh, but they all ask me about the blocks. Like, so can you show me how to do blocks with Java? I was like, what do you mean by that? Right. So this was uh, actually the block was, you know, the holy grail of small talk. It's true. I remember I got a book a long time ago when I first moved to Java. And it had, I just actually, I think I just recycled that book. It was just sort of, so out of date. Uh, it was a book about essentially for almost small talk programmers doing Java, or at least it was someone who'd come from small talk trying to think about how to do Java. And they were trying to deal with blocks, right? Which we now have as, you know, as closures, right? Mm -hmm. how, to, how to deal with these in uh, in Java. It was a big thing. But I, I would say I was on a, a migration project too uh, from Smalltalk to Java. Strangely enough, um, on a project I'd built in Smalltalk. So I was one of the original developers of a billing system in Smalltalk with Toplink and I helped translate it essentially into Java with Toplink. And uh, it was an interesting, interesting process. It, some things don't work, right? So class instance variables, didn't translate. There was no equivalent concept in Java, um, but it, it it mostly translated. You know, I think good object-oriented code can be translated into different languages. Mm -hmm. What uh, one of my favorite features of Eclipse Link is still is, but uh, is somehow less popular. It was it is the co cache coordination, and um, actually, what we always try to do is to misuse the entity manager for delta computation. So you could work with the entity manager with the entities, it will compute mm -hmm. the delta and send it somewhere else. And either yes. the other cache will be invalidated, you know, or updated, but having this flexibility, just focus on the objects and don't care about the updates. This was a big deal, but for unknown reasons, it never took off or it was not properly sold or I don't know why. So this was one of the killer features actually, not only of- It, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And and uh, the problem, I think that the problem was that Toplink was too technical, you know, um, in terms of uh, there was all kinds of features in there. There was even features added later on um, to like a couple of years ago to, to Eclipse Link to do things like, um, what am I thinking about here? The uh, the database, um, um, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, they changed the name of this uh, query. I can't recall. Basically, an Oracle database will send you a callback oh. through the JDBC driver when a, when a row changes. Uh, this is actually, change. I always ask myself why this is not a no big feature in Java. I actually did a talk, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. It should be JDK 1.2 or 1.3. And I ask, ask myself why the database does not you know, proactively notify the uh, via JDBC, via callback, that something changed. Yeah. Yeah, so it's in there. The Oracle database can do it, and Eclipse Link can take care, take advantage of that. Um, so these are the kind of things that are really interesting. But um, if you look at someone like a, like Hibernate, they would take a small feature and they would give it a, a name. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd say you know Hibernate X, mm -hmm. Hibernate Search, which actually isn't a small feature, but Hibernate Search, Hibernate this, and so they were very good at marketing, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think the Toplink team were far too. Uh, to developer centric, they were developers. They're just building code, doing cool features, and 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 didn't, even though we tried, uh, to sort of call out these features like cache coordination, which the name doesn't really sell you on the feature, right? Mm -hmm. um, powerful feature. So it's one of those things of Eclipse Link has lots of great features, um, but I think the marketing that we, was was not as great as we, <laughs> we would like it ever to have been, you know, or at least not marketing, but promotion of those features. Mm -hmm. Are you still involved with Eclipse Link? No, not so much anymore. No, I do. I do handle a few, a few questions here and there, but generally not. No. So when you stopped with Eclipse Link, officially? Uh, ooh, uh, four years ago, maybe. Oh, what you did in between between Eclipse Link and now? 
Ah, so I went from Eclipse Link over uh, to Oracle's mobile cloud service. Okay. So that was our mobile backend as a service. Um, we started from scratch. Like we basically started from nothing and, and designed and built this this platform. Mm -hmm. And I was I was on that for uh, for the to basically get to the point where we had designed out the first version mm -hmm. of the of that product. Uh, and then I moved back over to well I moved over to the, to the other part of the cloud back into the part that I was more comfortable with the Java side right the Java Java EE side where I, I really felt I had a bit, I was a better fit. Okay, so you were in the Java EE part. So this was the WebLogic cloud, right? The cloud, yeah. So we had Java cloud service, and then I was involved with the. Uh, the launch of the application container cloud, which is essentially a sort of, I guess you'd call it Heroku-like or a cloud-native solution, right? For deploying J Java SE um, and then Node, etc. All the small, small, lightweight applications. Okay, and uh, and then. Uh, well, I've moved over now. I'm working on FN. So um, within Oracle, we we have um, uh, we have what we're now calling OCI Oracle. Uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, which mm -hmm. is basically the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the, the the new the new stuff, the, the bare metal cloud, which we've now called we're calling that OCI, and we're calling the the uh, first generation or um, OCI Classic. And you'll see this in some of our web pages. Oh, okay. So I've gone over to the, I've gone over to the bare metal cloud, and we're building out a whole container native stack. So that's Kubernetes with you know containers, microservices, functions, and I'm specifically working on the the functions part. So this is the FN project, right? Yeah, so the FN is the the open source piece. Mm -hmm. So our our plan is, um, and I think we told everyone this. You know, we're pretty clear about it. We're building an open source platform. Anyone can run it anywhere. You could run it yourself on Amazon. You can do whatever you like. Uh, we will build this up, leave it open source, and then we're going to take it and we will we will make it available as a managed service. So rather than having to install it yourself and manage it yourself, we will basically say yes, enable that feature, and we'll take care of the the patching upgrade. You know, all the the usual cloud, the cloud benefits, right? Like we take care of the infrastructure for you. Mm -hmm. so actually, so, actually, but, uh, but everything's being done open source. It's actually a great move because if you get the adoptions from developer, developers, everyone knows the technology and this is easier to move back, you know, to the commercial solution. Yeah, and it's and the thing is out there, you know, there there's not a lot of choice. You you see a lot of all the functions platforms. They tend to be proprietary in the sense that you know it works on Microsoft, it works on Google. They have their own way of doing things. Um, there are some smaller open source, and there's a lot of well, I'd say there's quite a few small open source projects. And I I I assume we're gonna we'll see some sort of consolidation because we're not a lot of us don't disagree on a lot of basic things. Mm -hmm. um, we're a little bit different than, and we didn't join the OpenWIS project because OpenWIS is kind of a solves a lot of problems. Like it's a bit of a bigger solution than what we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, we think that uh, in a Kubernetes sort of you know Docker centric world, functions is just one piece of a, a bunch of things you may have in your environment. Mm -hmm. And and OpenWIS takes more of a here's kind of like everything you need in a box. You know, it's very it's it's a bit uh, more comprehensive. And we just want to solve the problem. A functions, right, or a, a provide a plat platform for functions and have that plat plug into whatever messaging you're using, whatever database you're using. You know, we're we're open to that. Mm -hmm. And when the so, FN project started, actually, uh, it's actually technically sort of an evolution. So um, one of my colleagues, Chad Aramura, had published uh, a blog post on Medium on on why we founded the FN project, and he talks about uh, how he came from the the company Iron Iron .io. Mm -hmm. And so at Iron, they had been building, uh, they had started with a thing called Iron Functions, basically a functions platform. Um, started building that, and the the development team for that that project, uh, open source project, uh, came to Oracle, and then basically this is an evolution of Iron.io, or Iron Functions, sorry. So it's not, we didn't sort of begin um, the function FN from scratch. FN was really the, the next generation or the next evolution of the Iron Functions platform, which, they didn't get that far. I think they maybe were six months into that that project, mm -hmm. um, but it was already getting pretty good reviews. And the model the model works quite nicely. This whole con container centric, you know, function equals container approach, mm -hmm. um, it seems quite seems to have traction. You know, people like the like this basic model. Mm -hmm. And uh, the FN project itself is language agnostic, so uh, there is one piece which does not actually know which language is used, right? Right, the server doesn't know anything. Almost all of it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> almost none of F. Almost none of FN knows what language you're in, because from the from the perspective of deploying your functions, scaling your functions, recovering all that kind of stuff, routing traffic, it's it's independent of the language. Right, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of there's some containers, right, being managed. The only time that 
that uh, you see language is when really it's the build side, the developer side. So if you're going to build a function and get it packaged as a container, essentially, mm -hmm. you need some kind of support. Mm -hmm. Like how do you, uh, well, you need it in two parts. You need it first, how do I, in the Java case, compile my Java function with whatever libraries I would need, package it as a container. And then the second part is the runtime part where once I've deployed it, uh, there is a contract. There is, uh, obviously, if someone calls a function, the router will send that call to the function, to the container. And so there's there's a, a contract between the incoming request to the container and then calling the Java code mm -hmm. or your, your language. And that's where our, our uh, FDK, the Function Developer Kit for Java, comes in. It basically, it's a shim or provides in one, one of its benefits is it provides a shim or a, a, a protocol adapter, a automatic protocol adapter that takes the incoming data to the container and calls the appropriate Java endpoint that you've identified with the appropriate parameters. But you so. actually are not dependent on this FD, FDK. So this is what I really find really nice in, uh, FN, F, in the Java FDK. Mm -hmm. You can just create a Java method and then use stock Maven without any dependency on FDK. And then you need the, I think, func.yaml or JSON. So I think a four-liner. So you have to tell, you know, this is the function and um, yes. this is the protocol and this is the name and the version. Yep. And then you need the FN build, which basically kicks uh, kicks off the uh, Maven build, creates the jar, and then creates the Docker image. I think this is what happens behind the scenes, and it ships it somewhere to the local or public Docker registry, right? Correct. Now, actually, this, for Java, you don't even need the build. Like You don't need any of our tools, any of the stuff that's provided for just convenience. So you can actually take a Docker file you wrote yourself mm -hmm. and just package your Java code and deploy it. So you can skip the build too if you really want to avoid anything. Uh, we, the if you look at the build, the build is trying to be clever. Mm -hmm. It uses a multi-stage, mm -hmm. multi-stage um, Docker build. Mm -hmm. So when you do the Java build, there's two images. They'll pull. Um, you'll watch the pull. You can watch the pulls go by, right? You can yeah. see them pull and open up the 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 build image, mm -hmm. which has Maven and so on. Mm -hmm. That'll produce. That'll compile the code, and then that code will get compiled or sorry, copied into a new image based on the runtime, the FDK runtime mm -hmm. image. So we're 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 basically just behind the scenes building images, like you say. You can skip it. You could have your own Docker file that contains your Java and go 100% like without us, and deploy that. This is even better. So yeah, exactly. I looked at I look at what happens, and there's some uh, Docker uh, Docker copying going on. So it copies the jar mm -hmm. in in a folder properly to pick it up yep. so you need some conventions and these are actually great news because i don't like you know dependency on third party tools because not only be, yeah, not because because of the dependency rather than because of the complexity if i know it's just pure java then i'm sure that nothing you no know, it's this is clear separation between the infrastructure and the business logic this is what i really appreciate yes 100% um, you can you can do everything yourself like i say the server doesn't know anything about it so that's why you can deploy even um, you know, we are, yes, poly, poly, uh, glot. Uh, glot, thank you, polyglot, <laughs> but, but even beyond polyglot, you can deploy anything as a function. And in, in the Java one, um, keynote, uh, when Chad was on stage, I believe he was showing the, uh, what we call the Vista demo, mm -hmm. uh, where it's a license plate recognition. Mm -hmm. And in that the functions aren't written in Java. There were some Linux libraries. I think it's image magic. Mm -hmm. He just, he just built a Docker container, uh, containing the appropriate, uh, libraries, um, he basically takes reads the reads, I believe, the um, data from the standard input, processes an image, and pipes the result to standard output. Uh, that's that's a function, right? There's no language per se. It's just packaging of existing components. And this is the, and that, the default format, right? So a standard in, a standard out. This is the uh, what you, if you don't specify the hmm. format, this is what happens behind the scenes, right? Yes, you get standard input, standard output. Yeah. So and uh, so then the FN server will call will pass the input and output and call the function, right? So it's, yep. So this is actually the, the, this is actually the first real world enterprise use case is integrations. So what we had to do, for instance, in the insurance companies or banks, they have no old software like you know C algorithm, which was not very stable. And we have to call it from the application server. And what we did, we encapsulate that with RMI, for instance, or sometimes mm -hmm. Corba. And now you could use functions for this because if a function die, you can start another one, right? Right. So as long as it's uh, well, 
Stateless isn't a requirement. I mean, it is in the sense that, um, you know, if that, like you say, the container could go away if it dies, mm -hmm. right? Um, you don't want to have state. But yes, taking existing C libraries or C, C programs, packaging them as functions um, makes total sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I could even provide uh, my own volume. And uh, if you call it multiple times, so it could actually work, right? Yeah, absolutely. This yeah. is not a best uh, practice, but it would work, I mean, if you... Not a best practice, and um, you can. So, with when you're using the hot functions, and so I should I should mention hot and cold. So, the hot the cold functions, or I guess we never say that default functions. Uh, when you call them, we get an, we get the image, we run the container, and then it gets it quits. Right, we it processes one request and it's mm -hmm. it's shut down. Um, when you go to a hot function. Um, we keep it alive, and it's basically a performance optimization, mm -hmm. right? So for Java, especially, you see um, that Docker takes a certain amount of time uh, to to boot up the container, mm -hmm. and then also Java takes some time to boot the JVM. If you use a hot function, we're reusing the container. We're sending it repeatedly um, calls. Uh, as long as it's active, we'll keep it. If it's idle for 30 seconds, no one's calling it, we'll we'll take it down. But that's the default time. Um, what was my point? Of, I thought what my point was that there's a hot functions. Uh, oh, I know. So in a hot function, you 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 would do things like in Java, you could uh, cache a, data, a database connection, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you would uh, have a function, it gets a database connection, or uh, it holds on to that, or at least um, uh, create a pool, um, holds on to that. So between invocations, you wouldn't have to reestablish that connection, which could be very expensive. But you still have to build your code very carefully to make sure you're not leaking state across invocations. That would be uh, poor poor. Uh, code but you could actually don't pull the connections rather than have one-to-one -one relation between a function and connection right if you well yes yes certainly absolutely that's what i already meant to say yes it should be one-to-one -one. i'm just saying you can hold you can hold that and, and reuse it yeah just that yeah, we won't mm -hmm. we don't multi th multi uh, th thread so we don't call the same function same instance of a container repeatedly mm -hmm. so there's no multiple threads running through it it's it has one one invocation so very like at a time. ejb almost right Almost like that, yeah. It's <laughs> well, basically it's it's simpler model to have scale out mm -hmm. than to have to worry. And and I, you know, this is a this is actually a really big point. And and the, and the EJB guys were right in this, in this sense. Um, this model allows us to not think about scaling. Yeah. Right? So when you write a function that just does its job, um, you know, it it suddenly you know you, you have some kind of uh, a function that's very popular. Suddenly it goes viral. Everyone's calling your function. Uh, you didn't plan for that, right? You don't plan for it. You write, okay, I have input, I have output, and if I'm very popular, the platform will just scale it out and have more instances of my function. Um, no contention, you know, management, nothing going on about threading. It's just simple one line of flow, right? One flow. Mm -hmm. How you do this with Docker? You know it that it uh, for hot functions that it still runs and keeps alive because usually you know if this is just one shot, it will. This is the cold functions. It's just default Docker behavior, right? So if it doesn't block, it just stops. So you are injecting some wait state, or you keep Docker alive, right? We we do keep it alive. Um, actually, it's a good question in terms of the the raw ones. I'm not sure. I know that in the in the case of the uh, the Java, I know that we can take control. I'm not actually sure what mechanism we're using to keep them alive. Okay. Because you're right. When you evoke them, they they would usually terminate when the main program is terminated. Mm -hmm. What I was immediately curious is about, you know, how to transfer more complex input and output objects. And you have some examples with JSON binding. And yes. uh, what I, it looks like you are using um, Jackson behind the scenes. Yes. And um, what I ask myself, I mean, JSON, I like JSON, and JSON is, and 90% of my project is using JSON and REST endpoint. But um, what, is there any way to create, my own format. So, what I would be interested in you know, to get the input stream and output stream. They could just use uh, Moxie or JSON objects or any Java e mapper and to provide my own objects. So, is something like this? Absolutely. Yeah. So, that, that uh, Jackson implementation is sort of default. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the, in the FDK, if you look at the FDK documentation, you'll see discussions about taking control uh, in terms of first uh, custom JSON or JSON mapping, so using Jackson and, and customizing it. But then you can replace that with your own implementation, your own protocol. Mm -hmm. So you can take complete control and you can make it so that, again, it's hidden from your application. So your application still has you know object come as input. Um, you don't have to mess up your your function code. You can do this uh, more more declarative, uh, sort of above or outside of that that uh, 
the function. So you could change the port the map the marshalling to something else XML, mm -hmm. heaven forbid, um, and your application code wouldn't know your function code wouldn't know. Are there any plans to support like the JSON P or JSON B, so the newest specs out of the box? But this would be a a nice deal because this JSON P, you know it properly, right? Or JSON dot yeah. yeah. And the JSON yeah. B is like the binding. This is uh, very similar what you have in your tutorials. Any plans to support that out of the box? Yeah, so we we looked at that and I can't remember there was some some timing issue or something for JSON B, but that makes sense, right? I mean we should be embracing the standards. So yeah. that's that's I would I, I would have preferred to default to the standard. Um, but for now, we went with Jackson. It's kind of popular. Um, I think it's just a, I think it, I think it was just a timing issue when we came around to okay, what are we going to use? Mm -hmm. And we do so since those guys are um, the team building most of that is is Oracle. We did have some I guess conversations with them, but there was something that stopped us from doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jason yeah, P even more important because the problem with objects is they are type safe. And if I have, let's say, I would like to implement more stable REST interfaces, I always go with the JSON P, not B, which is basically in hash map. So I can always provide more data and pick data which interests me. So I'm, uh, it doesn't break that fast. Because with Jackson, right. I will have to use you know, my own annotations, I think, nullable or nullable to indicate this is optional. And with JSON P, there is not a big deal. So I think you will have to support both. Well, you can. We can use them both now. Like I say, you can just go in and, and replace the default marshalling with with JSON P marshalling mm -hmm. now. Um, be interesting to try that out. I haven't tried it. I, I, w I would like to try it because uh, this, <laughs> I think, is a big deal. <clears throat> okay. Well, in the like I say, the FDK documentation for Java does discuss re um, changing the marshalling, enhancing the marshalling, and even swapping out the marshalling uh, implementation altogether. Mm -hmm. So I would I would start there. Mm -hmm. With um, if one function. Will would like to talk to another function over the network, so um, th then we are almost in the flow area, right? So I could just use curl and invoke it. So what would be this is I would like to, I could just use stock JaxRS client and talk to another function, right? This is like uh, FN uh, server name R application name yeah. slash function name, right? Yes, it's just a REST. Uh, sorry, so it's an HTTP endpoint. So technically, it isn't REST, <laughs> but uh, no, no, uh, you're right. This is just HTTP endpoint. Yes. Did you see the uh, the JAX RS support uh, dis discussion that was announced or that feature? No, I just look, look briefly at uh, the new newer features, but I... yeah, it was, so it was actually done by uh, an intern uh, in our Bristol team. There's a team in, uh, doing a lot of the Java work in Bristol in the UK, and. Um, and she built this some support for basically taking a JAXRS bean and making it a function. So it's it's it, there's a it's written up by um, Matthew Gilliard and he, he posted it on, on Medium. If you go to our F, FN Proj Twitter feed, you'll find a, a link to that that article. Hey, cool. But it's it's not perfect, mm -hmm. um, but it's a it's I think it's a port of some technology someone had already written for Amazon Lambda. Mm -hmm. And the essential idea is you've already got this bean with a bunch of endpoints on it. Let's hook them up as functions. Right? Let's just expose them as functions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that might you might find that interesting also um, for for sort of embracing sort of or migrating a stand, standard existing code into this new environment. Mm -hmm. So actually, the whole FDK project is absolutely optional, right? So I could just yes, I, I could just do whatever I like as long I is in the func.yaml one function which is addressable, fully qualified, and the uh, input and output are somehow ma mappable to. No, it's it's trickier than that. So so the FDK reads that funky YAML endpoint and knows how to invoke your your Java code, right? Oh, so if you okay. if you remove the FDK, you're left with a Docker container with some Java in it. Mm -hmm. So now it's your job to run the appropriate Java uh, VM uh, and route the output input, as it were, to the right place in your Java code. The FDK takes care of that for you. But this is right. But um, I, I look at the uh, at the format. So there is like a get. The payload as in body, right? In HTTP body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I will have to do is just to process that and invoke something with it, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm just saying that 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 declarative endpoint, uh, entry point of a function is something that uh, is specifically the FDK is reading. Otherwise, it would just be a, a command. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's a crazy idea. What what you could actually do is to run an application server in a container which receives the commands from FN server, right? I don't want to say yes, <laughs> but uh, but anything's possible, right? I mean, it it would be a well, okay. So if you had, if you were a hot function, 
uh, you gave it a, a long timeout, as long as you could, uh, which is, I don't recall the maximum. We were discussing the other day what's how long you could do it because people are thinking this. Um, like, let's say you want to take a, a lightweight server, run it in, inside of a function, you could, uh, but but the first time you invoke it, it's going to take quite a while to warm up, mm -hmm. and then it's probably going to probably going to get killed anyway, mm -hmm. right? Because it probably will will time out. So it's not ideal. In fact, what's interesting, and I, I made this comment the other day uh, to a group I was talking to, that all these functions I was I worked on application container cloud, which was cloud native, mm -hmm. and so you're very you're in that case you're very focused on building small lightweight applications, REST, web. Uh, using frameworks, you know, like uh, Java Spark, Drop Wizard, you know, embedded Tomcat, etc. Because you need to get from basically the the port that, where the incoming requests are to your code. And I, and it occurred to me that you know when you're writing functions, all the code that's between your code, your endpoint, and sort of the container or the incoming request is unnecessary. Like it's just gone. Like I don't think about Drop Wizard or Spark Java or embedded Tomcat anymore because they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, I basically reduced it. So in some sense, the platform has absorbed all of that. It's handling, it's handling scalability. It's handling routing. It's just basically invoking my endpoint at when you know with the arguments. All that infrastructure is kind of just obsolete in this in this space. Yeah, you are right. Um, you, you. I just thought about if I had already running microservices. In the application server, what they usually do, so the containers are lightweight enough, so the application server are pretty small. So I could yeah. actually misuse the F and Flow server to orchestrate my microservices. You could misuse it to do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could. <laughs> That's right. But your observation is right. So actually, with uh, the um, the whole the whole not. The, all the layers are gone, so you don't need any HTTP parsing anymore. Therefore, you don't need servlets, and if you don't need servlets, you don't need JAXORS. And thankfully, JAXORS is not depending on servlets, so this makes sense. Properly include that. Um, yes, yes, they did actually embed in that JAXORS support. I think they embed um, Jersey in there. Mm -hmm. And transactions make sense, but. Every call is a transaction, so uh, whatever I would do with database, like auto commit, so whatever happens is transactional, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you have to do it that way. Yeah, just yeah. The uh, the the one the big example we've been showing for Flow uh, implements uh, the Saga pattern, basically having to do compensating backout transactions when failures occur, mm -hmm. and and that's really all you can do because there it's just a number of distributed activities happening in network somewhere, uh, you know. Changing state, and if things go wrong, someone's got to basically handle the recovery for that and, and fix fix things after the fact. Yeah, but it's the same for microservices, so you cannot just have two phase commit yes. across. You know. That's right. So same thing. So what's nice with Flow, uh, and this sample shows you that um, you can write basically exception handlers, right? So when some distributed process is going on, something goes wrong, they can call you. Know, you get you get the chance to intercede and then handle that response, handle the the error response, and take a compensating uh, action. Mm -hmm. So this is actually great news. So you're working full time on this FN project? Yes, 100% on this right now. Yeah. yeah. This is actually pretty cool. And and it's yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. I just say the the thing is the um, I think what's interesting about this and this is this is why I sort of moved over here is I saw this this problem in the cloud native space. In cloud native I mean, you know, um, like a, a, a Cloud Foundry and, and Heroku and, and Oracle Application Container Cloud, all those worlds are designed, sort of, I guess, they're first generation in some sense, or early generation cloud. They're designed to make it easy to take an existing small application and move it to the cloud, mm -hmm. right? So small, again, again Tom, Tomcat, embed Tomcat, and so on. Small applications to the cloud. And they put you in a box. They say, okay, as long as you stay in this box, you're fine. We'll take care of everything for you. Um, the problem I found with talking with real world application developers, building applications on these platforms is they were always pushing against the walls. You know, they were always trying to do things that the platform was had taken away to simplify in, in, and in theory, improve their productivity. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a trade-off between productivity and, and control. Mm -hmm. and that's all, that's, that, was, that was always how we measured everything, productivity and control. Mm -hmm. You can get more productivity, but you lose control and so on and so forth. Uh, what I like about FN is it gives you that Choice. So I can go with productivity and just, like you say, use the tools, use the build, um, don't think about it too much. But if I need the power, I can just start writing Docker containers. Mm -hmm. I can do anything. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives me the best of both. So I, I felt that that was a, so for me, I thought that was much more interesting than that problem or the, the solution space that Cloud Native pr provided, you know, which is kind of like, yeah, deploy your small app and in a very contained environment. But uh, what's funny with what you mentioned, Tomcat and embedded uh, servers in the cloud 
what uh, why I'm using actually Java is because it turns out that in the cloud this is the smallest solution, and the reason is very similar to FN uh, project. If FM project is even more extreme. So if you push application servers to the cloud, what you're actually mm -hmm. pushing, you you are pushing, you know, N minus one layer. So but the N lower layers are immutable and they never change. And this is the right. base image from application server. And what yeah. only changes is the war. In my projects, the war was tiny. It was really kilobytes or below one meg. And this right. this was very fast on and, and the FN FN functions, they go even further because the, the whole platform is already there and I'm just writing, you know, the function. So just the function. So even less than I would usually write in my Java e apps. Yep. Yeah, it's basically, it's true, right? It's, it's very much the same problem. We just said, take your war and slice it into pieces mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll spread those pieces out. Uh, but actually what, what you're doing is what we had the last one of the last things I worked on 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 application container cloud was support for deploying a war. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's all you want to do. Just deploy the war, like you know, to my cloud, run it, yeah. right? Because it makes it makes sense. But then it's Java e unbeatable. I mean, no Tomcat or embedded Tomcat can compete because you will always, you know, have to, especially embedded case, create a fed war or fed jar, and this is just way too slow. So I'm too impatient to wait until everything builds. <laughs> yes, this is like really ugly. <laughs> Uh, t t uh, two questions. So the uh, discovery. So uh, each function has a unique name. So it is discovered. So if one function fails, just another is going to be started. So there's not like load balancing or something like this. As we already said, it's one to one relation. So one is. So if one function is too slow, let's say one function executes in two seconds, and I will call right. it twice. Will it start two functions in parallel? Ah, I see. So there's a certain amount of queuing. There is there is a sophisticated bit of load balancing going on. Mm -hmm. So there is, I, I should say, there's also support for asynchronous functions. Oh. So mm -hmm. if you in, in that case, if you mark your the type of function as async, your request will just get queued. Mm -hmm. So there's a queue back there. And so there's, if you uh, again uh, refer back to uh, my colleague Chad Aramura's um, medium posting on, on uh, I think it was. Uh, was it eight things? Oh, I can't remember now. Which are, he wrote a couple of articles. They're very good. One of them, he talks about the load balancer, the servers, the various pieces we have. So the load balancer is doing a lot of the work to figure out, should I scale? Shouldn't I scale? Mm -hmm. um, and if you go into our Slack channel, so we have a, a public Slack channel, you'll see there's actually some discussion uh, right now around some of the finer points of the load balancing algorithms that are being used to, you know, what high watermark do we use to decide whether we have room to scale things? And it's it's a, it's, a, it's actually one of the harder parts mm -hmm. um, of, of what they have to implement for FN. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like making those decisions. Do we scale up? Do we scale out? Do we run some more functions? Do we wait for that function to complete? Because we know its average execution time is, say, like you say, two seconds. Mm -hmm. What's the best experience? But it's what usually Kubernetes would do, right, in your case? Just schedule the containers. Well, Kubernetes gives us a place to run the, run them, but it doesn't it doesn't make those decisions for us. In our case, when we're deployed on Kubernetes, we are making the decisions about whether we need more. Okay. Right? So Kubernetes, you know, when you deploy to Kubernetes, you'll say, oh, I want... Uh, three instances of this. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, we're more dy dy dynamic. We're going to actually change the number of instances of a given container we're going to, going to run um, based on, on performance mm -hmm. info. So it's a little bit different, but we, we, do, uh, we are compatible running on Kubernetes, but we don't use it exactly like you, you, know, you would think a normal application would use it. Okay. Uh, but all the uh, metrics are going to be available via REST or whatever protocol, right? Yeah, so right now, uh, one of our fellows, uh, Nigel Deacon, he's working on the the uh, Prometheus feed. And there's actually right cool. now, mm -hmm. under, our under under FN project examples, you'll see Prometheus there. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got the basics going where we're streaming data to Prometheus and then using Grafana to, to, to put up some charts. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's so that we fit into other people's, you know, everyone's environment, right? Everyone's got these, uh, got, got Prometheus now. So uh, this makes us a good citizen in, in this space. Mm-hmm. So, this is really interesting. So it is like um, it. It appears to me like you know, exploded application server. <laughs> yes, it's true, right? All your all those. <laughs> I think of Jack's RS, and I think of all those different paths, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like we pack them together and there's advantages. This is where I struggle, honestly. It, it is a struggle between, I get the advantage in a JAXRS application of having common infrastructure in one place and maybe some you know, functionality, easy to manage also, mm -hmm. uh, versus the, it's one big blob, right? Uh, in the function case, I start slicing and dicing that, that same JAXRS bean into a bunch of pieces, but they can all scale independently. 
But then I may have to replicate code, like I may have to include the same code in the like utility libraries or whatever in each function mm -hmm. uh, container. So this a, it's a trade-off. It is a trade-off. But you know, memory is getting cheap and and CPU is getting cheap, so uh, we can waste a bit if we get a we get better elasticity. No, uh, absolutely right. So I'm absolutely with you. So RAM and CPU yeah. are extremely cheap. So this is yeah. exactly. And um, about patterns, so I think a a function could act or should act even as a facade, right? Because uh, it, it receives the data, and then I would just call more functions or have even a mid-range microservice behind a function. I don't think this is the best practice to have, you know, like the dream back then, container managed persistence where every get and setter was remote because they could and everything was yeah. distributed. I think this is not the right best practice. So I think this is a misunderstanding that the functions can be actually a course of facades to, to pieces of business logic, right? Yeah, I I know what you're saying. They're, they can be misused, right? So they, but but I do. We do. We do actually see a world where you're mixing functions and microservices. Mm -hmm. So you know, we see th some things that are just simply sim easier easier written as a, as a function. It just does a job and it quits. Uh, maybe it's even an async process, like microservice does some billing or something, yeah, exactly. and then it says, okay, send an email. Okay, invoke function, send them an email. It goes in a queue. It happens later. Um, we see that happening, and we see that that's the kind of platform, certainly at Oracle, we're trying to build is this world where you can run whatever you know, type of process or type of application you want. It should be heterogeneous. Yeah, basically all message-driven beans could be functions, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. In some sense, that's true. Uh, in fact, it's actually fairly similar. Yeah, it's uh, um, exactly the same, because uh, this file on forget is invoked and, and dice, there is... I mean, one transaction does actually, if you have a message-driven bean app, you could just migrate it one-to-one -to, -one to FM projects, just, you know, deleting the um, message-driven bean and, and replacing the command pattern behind. That's very interesting. Yes, that's actually, I hadn't thought of that, that uh, but that, that's actually exactly how I sort of explain the uh, the use of those, those async fun functions. Like I mentioned, just sending an email, it's exactly the case, right? Do the async processing in a message-driven bean become just a function? Yeah. And huh. and the uh, and the scheduling for each for every function is actually exactly the same as stateless EGBs because why you have multiple of these because you can you know set up the throttling and the pulling independently so if one crazy bean does not you know uh, overtax your server so this was this is the idea behind the pulling so this is very similar so you can have every every function with different. Uh, resource limits or of different scalability uh, configurations. Yeah, you can, you, and yes, you can customize uh, each function, like how much RAM it has, and then basically the resources, as you say. Although I'm not too sure on the on the queuing side, I'm not sure if we have fine, like function level controls on the queuing. Um, I think it. Of time it hmm. I think it. It is important. So in some project, we had even licensing issue with uh, payment gateways. So we are not allowed to have you no know, more than ten concurrent connections. So we did it with uh, max pool size, for instance. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's an interesting requirement. I don't know if we are addressing that yet. No, no problem. It's an open source project, so I could actually implement it t tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, I, that's an offer. I will take your phone. Okay. <laughs> Last question: uh, why, how, how, why Go? Because it was Iron IO. It was Go. So it came. It, yeah, it came from the Go. It came. The initial core core was Go, uh, and it's it seems to be the pattern, you know, because uh, that Docker's written in Go. A lot of the this cloud native uh, infrastructure Kubernetes is all written in Go, uh, so it seems to be a, a good language for building these kinds of infrastructure. I'm not saying it's a good uh, language necessarily for building your applications in, like business applications, uh, but it seems quite well suited to for infrastructural kind of uh, projects. So that's why it's Go. Um, we did take the um, just just so you know we took the the code underneath we, we called it at the time the completer the basically the the flow engine mm -hmm. you know so if you you know flow basically there's an execution graph back there and there's an engine that's basically tracking who's completed it you know and firing up new work uh, that was originally written in Go oh, sorry in Java but it was actually ported to Go uh, and then embedded as part of you know it became another another piece of the the, uh, the FN platform infrastructure so. I don't think that translation was too bad because Go is very good with concurrency mm -hmm. uh, libraries, mm -hmm. right? It has good uh, concurrency primitives and so on. So it was it was doable. Um, I think it was probably a bit. I think the the advantage, of course, is it was a bit lighter in Go in terms of the runtime footprint. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it, the team didn't seem to have much problems picking up Go and, and translating that piece. Um, 
but yes, it, 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 the core is in Go. So if you want to do some hacking and add that feature, you're going to have to learn some Go. Okay. And you are a Smalltalk developer. You like Go? Uh, actually, weirdly, I do like Go for these. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Smalltalk. Yes, for some of the Smalltalk-like features. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the biggest features in Smalltalk that was that was uh, missing in Java mm -hmm. um, was basically uh, what we called in Smalltalk protocols. Okay. Which was if a, if an object implements all the methods and parameters as another object, then they are protocol compatible. And you would see people talk about protocols as a, as a, a non. There's no type compile time typing, right? So. It would say, you know, these methods define this protocol. Mm -hmm. um, Go basically has that. Okay. Go has a mechanism where if you declare all the same methods and uh, function uh, type parameters as another object, then they are basically substitutable. They're compatible. And that's cool. It's really interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's done by the compiler. The compiler figures out that object is compatible with that requir the requirements of this other type. Um, so I thought that was really cool because you didn't declare an interface. You don't inherit from it. You just implement the methods. Uh, that are required, or the functions, and uh, and now you're compatible. Mm -hmm. Let's you do things like insert proxies where you don't expect proxies to to occur, right? You can do all kinds of clever stuff because yeah, for remote you build your application right. code. Yeah, it, it was a classic trick to use to do remoting. Yeah. Yeah, hey, cool. So thank you. Uh, this was really nice insight, and uh, that's a fun talk. Yeah, if you like, we can repeat it in one future episode about you know fn project 2.0 or whatever you're doing okay yeah when we're when we're uh well we're not even 1.0 yet so we have a ways to go and things are going to improve and there's more fdks coming so there's a lot of stuff going on so where people can find you or find about fn project so there's a landing page fnproject.io mm -hmm. they can go to that links off to slack to github so uh, Slack is where we have, you know, we have the activity. If you want to talk to the development team, ask questions, having troubles, there's channels on on Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a free free to use uh, Slack channel. Uh, and then of course GitHub's where, where where all the code is and where there's even you know more stuff going on there with issues and pull requests and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's where you can find everyone. And on and, uh, Twitter, it's uh, fnproj fn. P R O J okay. is the account. Oh, and finally, we just added a, a, a YouTube channel, uh, also FN Proj. And I believe your video, mm -hmm. uh, your short video uh, you did of uh, your first uh, impressions is actually listed on that page. Oh, thank uh, you. As, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's cross promotion, but uh, it was nice for you to walk through it. And so we, we put it on our, our page. Okay, perfect. And uh, you have also a Twitter account? I do. It's uh, Sean M. Smith. So S H A U N M. Mm -hmm. Smith. Okay. And uh, so I always write it with an M large so that people realize there's an M in the middle. <laughs> okay. I actually thought it was a typo with the email. I was like, okay, hopefully it is right, you know. So I have to try to. I reach know. I, that's the problem. Sean Smith is not that unique a name, yeah, yeah. it turns out. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good to talk to you.